All right. Happy Sunday, February 25th. This is Albert of Albert's List, your host of the Upwardly Mobile Podcast, where we talk about job trends, uncover job search tips, and more. It's good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. And today, we're talking about an interesting topic. Uh, as you noticed from the title, we're talking about how to guard against the death of the nine to five workday. I get sent a number of interesting things every week, chief among them YouTube videos that love to talk about the uh, doom and gloom that we have in today's working world. And you know what? I don't blame people for sending them. The economy feels like it's on a downward trajectory right now, despite everything the jobs report says, despite all the rosiness that we see coming out of the government and uh, all these tech layoffs, all these people who are out of work feel a certain type of way about where the future is going. And it's an interesting one. And so I'll drop this, lin this link. It's from the channel How Money Works. And it talks about the death of the nine to five workday. And you know what? Let's let's be fully frank here, right? The death of the nine to five workday is a topic that we see that is written about every single year. And, you know, it's written for good reason. The rise of freelancing, uh, the breaking down of borders, uh, the availability of sharing economy solutions, creating a more flexible workday and so forth are all reasons that people think that the nine to five workday is on its way out. And, you know, I'm, 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 I, I guess I would say that, you know, uh, for people who want individuals to go into that, what are their interests? The interests of the corporate elite who want people to work on their own, means that you don't have to offer benefits. It means that the fringe things that people have enjoyed, retirement savings, uh, discounts to places, the protection of a job, it's all changing and it's all evolving into something different. And you know what? It's understandably so. And in a lot of ways, it's also interesting because of the way that we are now looking at the commoditized workforce. And so you're asking me probably, what do you mean by commoditization of the workforce? Um, as I've observed and looked through the economy the last couple of years, and you know, Silicon Valley really kickstarted this in the 90s, it's become painfully aware to me that the way the economy moves is very much in a two-step track. And what I mean by that is you have two types of roles that have hopped up. And the way that these two roles are treated are different. And that's leading to the death of the nine to five workday. And so these two types of roles, one role is the commoditized role, which I can really describe as being a specialist. So you're really great at one thing like in social media or you're a graphics design person. Um, you're somebody who knows how to work through a spreadsheet and do so quickly. All of these are commodity-based roles because they're based on a unique and interesting skill set that an organization needs so that you can perform and get a project done. And the word project, I think, is important here too, and help the organization move into whatever it needs to do next. And the reason why these are now commoditized is because they're all based on skills that regardless of your capability to do them are uniform across international borders. So they are uniform across international borders. And what do I mean by that? When you have skills that are uniform across international borders, it breaks down the barriers for a business or an organization to truly be able to hire for them effectively. So it used to be right before the days of an Upwork or uh, people being able to go on LinkedIn and see who they hire and all, all that sort, that you would probably look locally for your graphic designer, your accountant, um, less so your account, your content writer, uh, because they're familiar with the customs of the country. 
But the internet has broken down those borders. And so now as a business owner, if I want to hire somebody who is that graphic designer or that social media manager, or literally somebody to do a repeatable task like post social media posts to my Facebook, to my ex, uh, to any other area online, I can hire somebody in India, in the Philippines, in Nigeria for a mere five to 10 bucks, 15 bucks an hour. And I don't have to pay them fringe benefits. They're online when I'm not. Uh, they do the work very, very efficiently. And the 10 to $15 an hour that I'm giving them, uh, for example, if I'm paying somebody in Indonesia where one US dollar is about 15,000 of theirs, uh, their currency goes a long, long way too. Uh, and so... I know that they'll be able to live. They may not necessarily ask me for a raise and they're not going to be struggling with trying to find an expensive apartment here in San Francisco. And so in this world where you have a commoditization that conflicts directly with a business's need to maximize revenue and in a larger business's need, the ability to get a return on investment for its investors. And so look, at the end of the day, none of this is really all great for somebody who has a commoditized skill in IT, graphic design, to an extent, content marketing. It eats into an organization's, uh, it, uh, it rather it takes away from what individual people have long known that is, you pick up a skill, you do it really well, and your pay will increase over time. Now, with a commoditized skill that somebody in a country far across the world can learn, it's pick up that skill, but you may or may not get that income that you want because somebody in Nigeria or Indonesia or Pakistan is knocking on your door to... Uh, to 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 try and take away that job potentially, but it's also not far fetched because it already exists at some level here on a local level. Uh, for example, in the San Francisco Bay Area where I'm located, uh, when I look up plumbing services or roofing services, I reach out to ten to fifteen places for multiple quotes because number one, I want to maximize the price for myself, and number two, I'm also looking for high quality. And as a service provider, um, which, you know, even is what Albert's List does too, uh, it's important that you're able to do the best work and also do it at a level where individuals can find it affordable to do so. And this case doesn't necessarily work in plumbing right now because we have a short, uh, we have a shortage of these plumbers and so forth who are not quite able to get to the work. So if I call a painter right now and I say that I need them by Tuesday, it's likely that every painter I call will tell me that they are booked out for the next six weeks because their service has been impeccable and they do a great job and there's a lot of work to be done, especially when interest rates are low and when uh, home buying is really, really, really hot. So, now that I've given you the doom for the last seven minutes or so, what I also want to provide here is what you can do instead of being that commoditized skill. And so the opposite of commoditization of your skill is being a strategic thinker. Strategic thinking is the notion of being able to come up with the right ideas in the right places to know how to move a business forward and then hand it off to the commodity specialists to go and take care of that. So whether you are thinking, okay, I can move this business forward by creating a content strategy uh, that will be supported by social media, content writers, and a web producer, you now move from the commodity-based role to the strategy-based role, and you are thoroughly compensated for your ability to hit the needs of the market as opposed to your ability to, uh, to, to be able to write really, really good lines of writing. And this is, at the end of the day, why CEOs 
and C-level executives are paid significantly more than your entry to mid-level content writer, for example, because they need to see the full 360 degree view versus maybe the one to two degrees that a content writer or a social media marketer would have to. And so how do you get there, right? That's actually, this is actually the hardest part of the whole thing because to go from being a commoditized individual to a strategic individual requires being a commoditized individual first. You need to be able to have your hands in the dirt to do the work before that work then gives you the right to go and create the own, create the rules that you can use yourself. And that requires some years of experience. It requires being able to read what it is that people care about. It requires being able to understand the best practices and then acting upon those best practices and making a better, uh, better like world for whatever industry you are trying to get into. So you quicken that up by understanding the strategy around the work that you've been assigned to do. And then you apply it into your own world, whether it's creating projects for yourself for a side hustle or looking for additional workers to help do that work for you or with you. And so is the death of the nine to five something that people are freaking out about? Yes, to one degree, I think it is because the need for strategic thinkers, which is the key here, is always going to be something that has to happen. However, when there is commodities of thinker of, of, of doers, that's where things change. Because if you're able to do these commoditized skills, the difference between you getting that job and the next person getting that job is merely you having a lower price potentially, along with high ratings, obviously, but also getting to that job first. One of the things that I have been seeing a lot is that the tips that I've seen is that people are saying that you have to uh, get to that LinkedIn posting and be one of the first 15 applicants. Otherwise, you're doomed because nobody's sifting through 600 different applications just to get to the bottom. And that's something to note because... If you don't realize that, then you're really going to put yourself at that level of disadvantage. And that's something to note as well. So just to reiterate what I've said in this first section, become a strategic thinker, have some of those commoditized skills, but know that you need to eventually transition. Get there by doing the research, reading the news, talking to other professionals, and sensing the patterns throughout your industry and how they work and how they evolve to keep up, and then focus on the medium to long-term gain. Yes, you can acquire those software engineering skills. You can acquire those marketing skills, such as writing or social media or graphic design, but in the long run, to keep yourself really, really competitive, strategic thinking is the way to go. There's no way about it. Even if you're a mid-level to senior level person, you must, must, must become that strategic thinker. So that's our main piece for today. If you like what I said, hit like, follow us, share this video with a friend. Uh, we're always growing as a channel and we're always posting webinars that we have. So stick around. We'll have a lot of content that'll be interesting to you if you're in that job search space. So let's go to the next piece of what we're talking about in this week's podcast. And as we always like to do, we like to witness the layoffs that are going on uh, within the industry right now. Um, we got news this week that two more media giants are laying off. Uh, one is Vice Media. Vice, as you know, the alternative news organization that first came on the on the uh, on the map many many years ago as sort of this re rebel to uh the mainstream way of doing news i know for one that uh i enjoyed watching a lot of these uh, tours in north korea uh that uh that vice's founder did for a long time they were always so good because they were authentic and it never seemed like there was a lot of 
uh, artificial creation around it. Vice, unfortunately, has decided to lay off everybody and stop publishing altogether. So that's pretty sad. Uh, BuzzFeed is also laying off 16% of its staff. And so these two layoffs really just represent um, a microcosm of what's been going on in the industry in general. Uh, layoffs in both of these areas mirror many things we've been seeing, such as the large cuts at the LA Times and other major newspapers like the Washington Post. Uh, the media landscape is rapidly shifting. Uh, customers are extremely fickle. And the ability to do long-form journalism and long-form work is uh, tough because you have a lot of guerrilla journalists. It's easy to start a website, get things, things quickly, right? Again, we should say commoditization of skills. If you can write and report and somebody else can do so, then it becomes very, very simple. However, if you can do long-form journalism that focuses specifically on a local issue that, you know, a Nigerian or a Filipino or even a Pakistani has to fly out for, that's what sets you apart. And so the erosion of the news or news industry is continuing to occur. Other layoffs we saw, Carbon Health let go of 56 people. Very small layoff, but something I wanted to note just because... Uh, it's a continued drawdown from COVID-19. Not as many testers needed, even though COVID does continue to rage in some parts of the country. Uh, those The reduction of these data analytics on COVID means that uh, the appetite for testing has reduced, and we're just seeing the in-kind capitalistic occurrences. And then we also saw that Rivian let go of 1,000 employees this week. Rivian, the electric vehicle car maker, uh, has been struggling. And, you know, most of electric vehicles and even Tesla is struggling because electric vehicles are expensive. And even with all the tax credits, they are in the tens of thousands of dollars above 20, 30, 40,000. And so they have realized that they're going to market a lot slower. And so they decided to part ways with a bunch of their employees this week. And it'll be interesting to continue to see how that industry evolves over time. But speaking of an industry that is growing and, you know, moving into our other topics of interest segment, um, speaking of an industry that is growing and growing a lot and significantly, NVIDIA, right? We've talked about AI. My original topic was probably going to be something AI focused this week, um, but I got bumped back to here. But NVIDIA had earnings this week that completely blew off any expectations. Their revenue's up 200% year over year. Um, they're looking at three-digit percentage increases for projected revenue a couple of quarters ahead. Uh, and it's all because of the explosion in demand for AI chips. Everybody wants their AI chips so that they can go out and transform uh, their businesses. And NVIDIA is at the heart and center of it. We all knew NVIDIA for the longest time as that organization focused on graphics cards and uh, gaming, and now they are firmly in the AI world. And you know, this chip demand and this place continues to grow. We reported a couple of weeks ago on Sam Altman's $7 trillion um, ask, and this is right along with it. So, you know, it's this place is going to continue growing. You're going to see even more as we go forward, and it'll be something truly amazing to watch. Speaking of AI, uh, we'll go to the flip side of it and go to something where we talk about AI as it relates to jobs. Um, there is growing, growing concern that AI is rejecting job applications. And we knew this would happen because this always happens. This is a, a mere evolution of the applicant tracking system conversation and the applicant tracking conversation has now turned into artificial intelligence and we have two interesting things to report one being that in new york you can now opt out of being part of an ai uh, process within your job um, application and we'll see if that extends to anywhere else Right, AI regulation is interesting across a lot of different prisms and lenses because 
it presents the pushback against innovation. And maybe AI and job applications isn't the innovation we're looking for, but unfortunately, it's the one that we've got. And according to two out of every three, 66% in a Pew study, they also say that they don't want AI in their hiring processes. So, you know, maybe it's inevitable, maybe it's not. We will see. And so with that, I also wanted to go to our final topic of the day, which is this week's event promotions. We have two events this week on Albert's list. One, uh, which is our 88th mock interview since the beginning of the pandemic. We'll be featuring Corey again and bringing back Candy um, or bringing in Candy. She is a product manager. And we'll be answer, asking the tough questions. Interviewing, as you know, is tougher than ever in this market because there are so many applicants. So if you get to the end, it's all about being able to uh, thread that needle and minimize your mistakes. And then the second job, second one what we're doing is how to land a data analytics job in 2024. That one takes place on Thursday at 5 p.m. And as we all know, data analytics is growing in importance and growing in demand because more and more organizations are adopting generative AI and AI technologies. And part of being able to do that is becoming that data analyst where you, um, becoming that data analyst where you clean data, where you uh, check for biases and so much more. And so Omni of dataford.io will be here to share with us the uh, ways to uh, break into that job, how to answer the interview questions, including any technical questions. And so be sure to join us for that. The link to join will be in the show notes below. All right. Well, that's it for this podcast for this week. If you made it all the end, thank you for listening. Uh, hit like, hit subscribe to support the channel. Share this channel with a friend. We have many job search videos every single day. And with that, I wish you a great week ahead. We'll be back sometime around this time next week talking more about the job search trends that are impacting and influencing the everyday in your life and career. And we look forward to sharing any new strategies and tips and tricks